multiple attributes to us, and it says that they're clear, clearly seen, not just seen, but clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. Uh, Psalm 19, 1 also tells us that the heavens tell of the glory of God. They display God's glory. And of course, you know, I, I've taught using these verses many, many times, and, uh, you know, usually it's in a class where I'm talking about general revelation, meaning that God has revealed himself in general ways to all of humanity, and so humans are without excuse. But, you know, as I was thinking about that, I thought to myself, you know, every time <clears throat> I, as a Christian, step outside the door, I'm really stepping in to God's creation. I'm a part of God's creation, and heaven and earth declare to me the glory of God. And yet I wonder, how is it that I can walk outside, but I don't reflect upon the creator when heaven itself is screaming to me of the glory of God in the creation? So shouldn't, shouldn't creation, the work of God's hands, prompt me as a Christian, even more than an unbeliever, to have thoughts about the creator as soon as I walk into creation? Now, you know, let me just give you an illustration. There's a lot of times when I go places, I try to do multiple things. You know, I go to multiple places at the same time in order to save gas, in order to save time and all that. So if I'm going to go to the doctor's office, I'll think to myself, well, Home Depot's nearby. As long as I'm at the doctor's office, it's not that much further to Home Depot, so there's no sense in going to Home Depot today when I could go there tomorrow when I see the doctor, you know, that type of thing. But what often happens is that when I get in the car after the doctor's office, I'm thinking about other stuff, and my mind is kind of on autopilot, and I automatically just start driving home. I, I'm not thinking about anything, but things in my head. I'm driving home. Halfway home, I say to myself, wow, I, I was supposed to go to Home Depot. Now i got to turn around or else make it another trip in another day. So what I've done, if I think about it, is I take a piece of paper before I leave home, and I wrote, write Home Depot on it, and I put it in my car on the seat next to me, and when I get out of the car to go to the doctor's appointment, I take the paper and I put it over my instrument cluster in the car that says Home Depot. So when I come back from the doctor's office and I get in the car and start the car, there's a sign there that says Home Depot, and I know I'm supposed to go there. In other words, this paper that has Home Depot on it triggers in my mind the idea that I need to go to Home Depot, and it kind of sets my course after being at the doctor. So I was thinking to myself, you know, if a paper can trigger thoughts about Home Depot, I wonder if I can train my mind to be triggered to think about thoughts of God, specifically God the creator, when I expose myself to creation. Is that possible? And so I've kind of been working on that in my life as strange as this is. In fact, you know, you guys don't judge me. You guys may think this is the weirdest message ever, but it's really been enlightening to me to do that. You know, so the doctrine of God as creator is like a hugely important doctrine in the Bible. You know, when God first introduces himself to us, he doesn't do it with the definition of God. He doesn't do it by listing a bunch of attributes of God. He introduces us, uh, himself to him through an act. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And this verse really uh, puts a Christian worldview into a nutshell. It's a nutshell verse that explains the Christian worldview. Because you and I understand everything around us in terms of a creator and the creature. God is the creator, we are the creatures, and we understand intuitively that there's a fundamental difference between us and God. There's a fundamental difference between his attributes and ours. There's a fundamental difference between his power and ours, his action and ours, his obligations and ours. They're completely distinct. And I think that it would do us a tremendous privilege, or not privilege, it may be a tremendous benefit to us if we could remember these things about God more regularly than we do. I mean, my goodness, creation is there every single day, 24-7. If for some, some re way that we could use this that's already out there to think about God and to think about these things about, the, about God, I think that it would be more helpful than the paper on the dash. 
And that's kind of what my topic is uh, for this morning. And so let's pray and then let's think about if there are ways that we can trigger thoughts about God throughout the day as we expose ourselves to his creative work and the glory that is there. Our Heavenly Father, we really thank you this morning for the opportunity to get together and to worship you. Thank you that you're such a loving God and good God and gracious God to us, that you have revealed yourself to us through your Son, the ultimate revelation, that as as has been read, that all things have been made through him and for him and by him. And God, as we reflect upon you as the creator in the world today, I pray that we would broaden our ability to think of you more regularly throughout the day and that you would prompt us to have God thoughts in a, in a world that we're in that you have declared reflects your glory. So I pray that you'd be with us this morning and guide the time that we have, that your spirit would work. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before I talk about um, what thoughts we should maybe be thinking if we were reminded of God through creation, I'd kind of like to flesh out a little bit more the foundation of who God is as the creator, just so we have a baseline to know who it is that we're thinking about. Uh, the first thing that I would like to point out is that if we're talking about God being the creator, it means that the universe is not self-created. In other words, creation is an act of God for his glory of lo alone. And before creation, there was nothing but God. So when God created, he created out of nothing. He spoke and it came into being. Psalm 36 verse th 33 verses 6 and 9 says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. A second thing that I want to point out is that not only is the universe not self-created, but creation was a free act of God's will. In other words, God didn't need to create anything. Uh, God didn't create in order to fulfill some desire that he had. God didn't create to make himself happier or more satisfied or more perfect. <clears throat> God simply created because he wanted to. <clears throat> if you look at Revelation 4.11, it's kind of a tribute to God's worthiness to receive glory and honor and power. And it says, for you are worthy, O Lord, and our, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. And here's the reason that is given. For you created all things, and by your will, more, more literally, by your desire, they were created and came into being. So the fact that God created anything was simply because God wanted to create it. So God created every, everything that exists out of nothing. And thirdly, we have to remember that God took pleasure in creating. In fact, God takes pleasure in everything that he does. In Psalm 115, 3, it says our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Literally, instead of pleases, you could say take pleasure in or delight in. Our God is in the heavens he does what he takes pleasure in. He does what he delights in. In Psalm 135, 5 and 6, For I know that the Lord is great and that our God is above all gods. Whatever the Lord delights in, he does. Whatever God wants to do, he does. He does it in heaven and in earth and in the seas and in all the deeps. So whenever God acts, he does it in a way that is pleasing to himself. God's never the victim of circumstances. God is never trapped. God is never coerced. God is never put in a corner. God is never forced to act and to do anything that he does not want to do. When God acts, he does it in a way and it brings delight to him. In Psalm 104, 31, it says, <clears throat> May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. You know, this isn't uh, a prayer expressing hope that something is going to happen. He, the psalmist is not saying, boy, I hope that God is going to rejoice in his works, but I'm not really sure if he's going to do that. 
I mean, if that's the case, we have real problems because the first part of that verse is parallel to it in grammatically. He'd be saying, I hope God's glory will endure forever, but I'm not really sure it will. Well, that's not what he's saying at all. The psalmist is making a statement of praise saying that God will rejoice in his works. God's glory will endure forever. And I'm in favor of that. May it be, may it come to pass just as God desires it to come to pass. So this is what I'm talking about. These are the things that I'm talking about. And these are the things that I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about God as the creator and God demonstrating his power in creation, the power that brought something into existence when nothing existed. The whole universe is dependent upon him. And, you know, as we think of God as the creator, you know, just as the world was not self-created, we also need to remember that the world is not self-sustaining either. God is the sustainer of all things. So when we think of God in terms of the creator, we're not just thinking of Genesis 1. We're thinking of his sustaining work in creation, providing for his creation the things that it needs in order for it to continue to exist. Now, one thing that I didn't comment on in my notes, and I'm thinking of making it into a future message, but that God is not only, has not only created, and he not only sustains creation, but he's also going to eventually redeem creation from the curse and sin and everything else and bring all things into submission to Christ. But that's not really what I want to talk about this morning, even though that's probably the most glorious part of the whole thing. But uh, God, God is the sustainer of all things. Nehemiah 9.6 says, You are the Lord, you alone. You've made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. Acts 17, 25, Paul is giving a speech, and he says, he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. Gives is a present tense verb, and you know it doesn't always mean this, but it, it, it's a continual action. In this case, God is continually giving to all people life and breath and all all things. If God stopped doing what he does, if he stopped giving life, you would cease to exist. If he stopped giving breath, he would cease to exist. The reason why you and I are sitting in this room and able to hear this message is because God presently, by his will, is giving you life and giving you breath so that you can sit here and live and listen to this message and Lord willing, be able to walk out and still be alive as well. All of that is from God. Psalm 104, I think, is a beautiful psalm, and this is really kind of the the focus of what I want to emphasize this morning, is the way the people in the Bible perceived the world. Remember we talked about how God is the creator, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and is kind of a nutshell of a Christian worldview. And the preservation of God in preserving the world is also part of our worldview. Psalm 104 says, He sends forth springs in the valleys. They flow between the mountains. He waters the mountains from his upper chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of his works. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and vegetation for the labor of man so that he may bring forth food from the earth. And I skip down some verses. You appoint darkness and it becomes light in which all the beasts of the forest prowl about. I skip a few more verses and then I come to there is a sea great and broad in which are swarms without numbers, animals both small and great. There are ships that move along and Leviathan which you have formed to sport in it. They all wait for you to give them their food in due season. You give it to them. They gather it up You open your hand, they are satisfied with good. You hide your face, they are dismayed. You take away their spirit, they expire and return to the dust. You send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the earth. So in all these ways, the psalmist looked at God as being intimately involved in everything. I mean, God sends forth the springs, God waters the mountains, God causes the grass to grow, God appoints darkness, 
God gives food to his creatures, great and small. God sends forth his spirit. Life is created. God takes away his spirit, and they perish. God is involved in every process that takes place outside of that door and every process that takes place inside of this door. God is involved in everything. God is involved with the rain, the wind, the sun, the moon. God is, in, is involved in everything. And in Isaiah 40, 26, God says, lift up your eyes and see who has created these stars. Look into the heavens, and he says you can see who created the stars. The one who leads forth their host by number, he calls them by name because of his greatness, of his might, and his strength, of his power. Not one of them is missing. So God is utterly transcendent in these verses. God is exalted above his creation. He is distinct from his creation. He is greater than his creation. He's the one who created the stars, but he's also close to his creation. He leads them. He leads them like a shepherd leads the sheep. The stars aren't uh, numberless objects out there that God has no idea what, what they are or what they're doing or doesn't pay any attention to him. He calls them by name. He holds them in place by the strength of his power. He holds everything together. In fact, it's, we find out when we read Colossians 1.17 that it's actually Christ who holds everything together. It says, he, that is Christ, is before all things, and in him all things hold together. This, this is a perfect tense. Sorry so, for so many verbs, but it's important and interesting. He holds it together. He held it together in the past, and he continues to hold it together even now. If Christ ceased to actively hold the universe together, the universe would fall apart. Christ is the one that holds the atoms of matter together. In short, God is both the creator and the sustainer. So when we think about God, we need to realize that the universe is with, upheld by him. Without him, everything would cease to exist. The source of our existence is outside of ourselves. It's being managed by the will of God. And God sustains everything and everyone, so we're totally dependent upon God for everything. So creation and the processes of creation testify to God. And in my opinion, we should be reminded of that. We should be reminded of those things when we go outside. They should trigger thoughts of God providing and sustaining and creating everything, and it should prompt a response in our house, in our hearts. So what do we think about? Well, if God made all things, we should think that God is also the owner of all things, right? If he made it, it's his. Deuteronomy 10, 14, Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the highest heavens, the earth and all that is in it. Psalm 24, 1 and 2 says, The earth is the Lord and all it contains, for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Psalm 50, 12. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. For the world is mine and all it contains, the world and all those who dwell in it. Job 41. Who has given to me that I should repay? Whatever is under the whole of heaven is mine. <clears throat> the fact that we're God's creatures and we live in his world and the fact that God made the world means that God owns the world, and the fact that God owns the world means that we're dependent upon God. That's why in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, Paul asks the question, what do you have that you did not receive? There is nothing that you have that is of your own because everything is God's. The world is God's and all that it contains. If you have anything, it's because God is loaning it to you, right? Th that's where the idea of stewardship comes in. In John 3, 27, a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. So when I walk outside the door into creation, one thing that I could remember is that this is God's world. I only have a place in it. This is God's world. And I have responsibility of, as a steward to manage what God has given me. That would be a very good thought to have. And I should manage things. I should manage my time, the life, the breath that God continues to sustain me with in a way that glorifies God. Because it's his, not mine. 
so it should be used for him and not me. Well, if God is the owner of all things, it also means that God is the Lord of all things. If he made everything, he has the right to rule everything that he has made. As the creator, only he is able to interpret creation. Only he knows the processes by which the world came into being. Only he understands the purpose and meaning of creation. And as Lord of creation, he has total authority over everything that he has made. He has the right to do with his creation as he pleases. He has the right to tell human beings what they need to do as moral beings within his creation. He has the right to set standards for humanity. So maybe when I walk out of the door into creation, I ought to be thinking that God is Lord. He's my master. I serve him. I need to remember to submit to him. And maybe I should remember that on, the, on that basis, I shouldn't complain against him or question his goodness or his, the way that he's working in the world. Now remember, we talked about the fact that God sustains all things. If God sustains all things, then God's presence is in all places of the universe. In other words, if God, God's presence, when we talk about the omnipresence of God, we mean that God is present everywhere at an, and at every time. If we say that God is present, we also mean that he's here, that he's now with us. But the question is, is, you know, how do we know that God is with us? How can, you know, we can't see God. We, how, how can we tell that God is with us? Well, we can tell that God is with us because he's sustaining us, right? <laughs> the fact that you're alive tells you that God is present with you because God sustains you by his hand. The fact that the universe hasn't blown apart tells us that Christ is still there sustaining it. He's upholding, he's holding the universe together. So I tell you, when I walk out the door, I can be thankful that God is present with me. If I can walk out the door and be triggered in my mind to remember God is the creator, and the owner, and the Lord, and that I'm alive because he is the one who is sustaining me. It will result in praise and honor and glory going to God. So if we tune our mind into these things, I think that we can improve. I think that we can use creation as it was designed to be used to, re not, to see the glory of God in it and then to reflect the glory. Okay, now here's where the message gets weird. I just got to tell you, some of you, I know I already predict the thing. You're going to be rolling your eyes. You're going to be looking at each other and go, oh, no, the old man's, you know, lost his mind. He's kind of gone off the end. The, the elevator isn't going to the top anymore. I can hear all the things that you guys are going to be saying, all right? All right, here's, here's my illustration. It is kind of weird. It's almost kind of embarrassing to say <laughs> that, I'm, that I'm going to, all right? I, so I watched this movie, Fearless. Fearless is about this martial arts guy, right? And some tragedies happen in this guy's life. And he goes into depression, and he ends up getting kind of adopted by people who are in a farming community. And so he kind of learns that what, what's important in life by being in this community. All right, so now I hope everybody can see me. But they're all, like, uh, they're all planting r rice at the same time in the field. So they're, you know, they're down there, you know, planting rice. They're all doing that. All, a bunch of people are all, and he's one of them doing that. And then the breeze blows. Has anybody seen this movie? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <So they're laughs> Thank you, David. You'll understand this. <laughs> yeah. so, so they're planting this rice, and the breeze blows, and all of them stand up and go like this. And the breeze is blowing through their, through their hair and in their face, and they're just enjoying the breeze. Now, <laughs> look at Ed. His look on his face is, oh, my goodness, what's this all about? <laughs> okay, so, but, but at that time, Jet Li, who's the star in the movie, doesn't realize that, right? So eventually he comes to know that when the breeze blows, you stand up and enjoy the breeze. All right, now, that's not the weird part. The weird part is, <laughs> the weird part is, I, I kind of like was impressed by that, you know? And so when I'm working in my yard, and it's really hot, this is the weird part, and, the, and it's, you know, I'm working, doing something, and I feel the breeze blow, I stop and I close my eyes, but I'm not thinking like Jet Li, I'm thinking, God is the one who sends the wind. God is the one who has sent the breeze. I enjoy the goodness of God in the breeze 
and I thank God for it. <laughs> so here's my point. As weird as that sounds, I think, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but as weird as that sounds, I think that God is intimately involved in his creation. God causes the sun to rise. God sends the wind. It, it just doesn't happen. It just doesn't come to me through natural forces. God is the one who sends the rain. And it seems to me that if the breeze is sent by God, it can remind me of God and cause me to thank God for what he has done. Creation displays the glory of God's perfections. It displays his wisdom. It displays his power, his divine nature. So the universe is really just a masterpiece of God's wisdom. Jeremiah 10, 12 says, It is he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom, and by his understanding has stretched out the heavens. Psalm 104, 24 says, O Lord, how many are your works. In wisdom you've made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. God's power we already seen being displayed in Romans 1.20, we read that one already. His invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. If they're clearly seen, being understood through what is made, then we should clearly see them. In Psalm 19, which I also read at the beginning, the heavens tell of the glory of God, the expanse declares the work of his hands, day to day ports or speech, speech, night to night reveals knowledge, there is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, but their line has gone out through all the earth. Isaiah 40, 26, which we have also read. But it says to lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars. So it's my opinion that the scripture is teaching us that the heavens really are speaking and revealing the glory, the wisdom, and the power of God, and what they say is intended to be heard. But we need to lift up our eyes, and we need to be conscious of the fact that God is working in the world. And what happens in this is that if we, if we sense and see the glory of God in the world around us, then it'll stimulate worship. All of creation wor itself worships God. Psalm 148 says, Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. Now you think, well, you know, I mean, obviously this is figurative language. Sun, moon, and stars are inanimate objects. You know, they don't have a mind. They don't have a voice. They don't have anything. But what the author is saying is, he's saying, translate their glory into language. Translate their obedience into language. Look at the stars. Look at the glory of the stars. Realize that they do exactly what God wants them to do. They're in perfect obedience to him. And in that sense... They're praising God. But it also prompts worship, not only in creation, but among us on the earth. Psalm 95, come let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is he, his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us worship, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock of his care. We sing for joy, we shout aloud, we come with thanksgiving, we extol God with music and song. Why? Because he is the great God above all other gods. He's the great king above all others. He made the world, so let us worship and bow down before our maker. Creation prompts praise not only among creation, not only on those among the earth, 
but it prompts praise in heaven as well. <coughs> in Nehemiah 9.6, we already read that, but uh, you've made heaven, the heavens of heaven and the host, and then at the end of it says, the host of heaven worships you. Isaiah 6.1, which we read a lot probably as Christians off and on, the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord, this is Isaiah's vision of God, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, lofty and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the uh, robe filling the temple. Seraphim, which are angelic beings, stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. In Revelation 4, there are also two heavenly scenes of worship. We read the one, Worthy are you, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things. That's why. And because your, of your will, they existed and were created. Revelation 14, 7. An angel speaks and he says in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. So when I walk out the door, maybe I should lift my eyes to the heaven and, and praise God. Join creation. Join others on the earth. Join those in heaven in the worship of God, our creator. Creation also generates thanksgiving. Thanksgiving and praise go together. Not only would it generate thanksgiving for God sustaining us, but it, it generates thanksgiving in just seeing the glory of God, that he's such a great God. So Psalm 147 says, Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praises to, the God, to our God with a lyre, who covers the heavens with clouds, who provides rain for the earth, who makes grass to grow on the mountains. He gives to the beast its food. Well, let me kind of conclude by saying this. Creation is a display of the glory of God. It's not just a display of the glory of God for the unbelieving world. It's a display of the glory of God for all of humanity, everything that God has made. It displays his power. It displays his divine nature. It displays his wisdom. His sustaining care, he, we are see on a day-to-day -day basis the fact that everything continues to resist. It reminds us of his presence. It reminds us, as we look at creation, that God is owner of everything. It reminds us, as we look at creation, that God is Lord of everything. It prompts us to be thankful and to praise God. So my challenge to all of us and myself is to train our eyes to see the glory of creation, to look to the heavens like Isaiah did, and to praise the God who made everything. Jesus said, you know, that the, if the birds are fed, it's because God feeds them. If the grass is clothed with, flower, clothed with flowers, it's because God has clothed them. God stands behind all of the natural processes. And for that reason, when you read in the Bible, you don't read of people saying it's raining. Instead, they say God sent the rain. You see, in, in, in the Bible, they had a worldview that God was the creator and that everything came from God. And it was reflected in their language. You know, we can do that. Uh, you know, we have done that. Don't you know people that, you know, they say, oh, man, I, I was so lucky today. And, and people who are Christians hear that and go, lucky, lucky. Well, lucky excludes God. We don't want to use the lucky, lucky word. And I, we shouldn't because it does exclude God. It acts like it's, it, it's a word that is excluding God from the whole process of whatever we were lucky in, right? So what do people say? They say, no, you weren't lucky. You were blessed. Well, why can't we change our vocabulary in other ways, too? How about when it rains, instead of saying it's raining, to say, wow, God sent the rain? Or didn't God send a beautiful breeze today, instead of just saying, I feel the breeze? Say what we believe. Use the creation, use the working of God to acknowledge his worth, to acknowledge his glory, to acknowledge his working. Thank him for taking care of us. When we go out the door, we should look for the unfathomable wisdom, the infinite power, and the divine no nature of God magnified in creation. But most of all, for me, I think, that when I think of creation, I realize that this is just looking into a mirror dimly. <coughs> 
Whatever glory is reflected in creation is nothing compared to the glory that is going to be revealed when we see God face to face. So maybe when we walk out the door and we are thanking God and praising God and recognizing God in all the things that he's presently doing and all the things that he has done, maybe it'll prompt in us the thought, I can't wait to be in the presence of God someday with his unmitigated glory streaming out before me. Maybe we can train ourselves to do that. Sing for joy to the Lord. Come before him with thanksgiving. Extol him with music and song. Bow down in worship. Kneel before the Lord our maker. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He looks on the earth and it trembles. He touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing for him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, you are the great God. You are the creator of all things. You're the creator of us. You're the sustainer of all things. You're the one who keeps us alive and provides for us for our daily provision. God, you have said in your word that the heavens tell of your glory. You have said that they speak of your wisdom and your divine nature. And God, I just pray that since we are exposed to your creation 24-7 every day of our lives, that we would begin to reflect upon your working within it and your presence with us, and not only the glory that is there, but mostly the glory that is to come, the glory that you made possible for us through the death of Christ on the cross that we can spend an eternity with you. God, I pray that in practical ways we would see creation like the paper in my dashboard as a trigger to think of you more often. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand.